Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. We uh, uh, welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we bring you different approaches to understanding how to pray with the Bible, not to mention bringing you a biker gang. It's great. You know, a bunch of Catholic bikers here. Makes me feel like I'm back in Chicago. <laughs> this is a great thing. We'll talk more about them later on. Today, as we go through the passion of our Lord in my book, Wheat and Tares, we are going to look at our Lord's final statements while hanging on the cross and especially focus on how our Lord Jesus fulfilled Psalm 22. He's able to reach out to those who have lost their faith in God, who sometimes claim to be atheists, but oftentimes just don't know where else to go, as well as to victims of abuse and others who are suffering abandonment and feel far away from the love of God. Now, of course, if you have questions and comments related specifically to today's topic, we invite you to be part of the show. During the live show, you can do what these nice folks have done from Ohio and Indiana, Louisiana, Texas, other places, and uh, join us here in the studio audience. Or during the live show, you can also call us. Remember, the live show is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can call in here if you're in North America by calling 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America, you can still call, but the number is country code 1, area code 205-271. Two nine eight zero. You can also contact us by me email, writing to Scripture and Tradition at ewtn.com, or follow us and partic participate with the show on YouTube. All right. So, if you're going with us in my book Wheat and Tares, restoring the moral vision of a scandalized church. Uh, we're in chapter 6, and by the way, the book is still available at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com, and the book is item number 81098. And if you're following in the book, it's page 152 where we're starting today. So, um, we'll start off talking about our Lord's three final statements while he's hanging on the cross. You know, I like to remind myself and other people that death is the second most important moment of your existence. Your conception is the first and most important. That's the moment when you and I begin. All of our DNA is there. No more gets added. It's all right there. And it develops that, at, from that point of conception, the child develops into who we are as adults. But then death is a great uh, moment, and we need to pay attention to the importance of both. So this is a, a great thing for us to consider especially when taking a look at Christ. Now, Christ, by the way, is a little bit different from the rest of us. We did not get to choose the moment of our conception. He did. Remember how it says in John 1, 14, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was a choice of the infinite Word of God, Jesus Christ made flesh. And this is something that just happens to us, but for him it was a choice. Death is the moment when life is pulled together in so many ways. And this is where we get defined for all eternity. 
where we are at the moment of death determines the rest of eternity for each of us. Death is something inevitable and we, we can't avoid it. And we can't avoid death becoming the moment that shapes us for eternity. Throughout this life, the Bible oftentimes compares us to clay. We're being molded. And the question is twofold. One, who is molding us? Is it God our Lord? If it is, he'll mold us into his image and likeness. He'll make us more and more like himself. If it's Satan, he'll mold us into a nightmare. He'll make us very wicked. If it's our culture, they will mold us and shape us only insofar as it helps them to use us. And that what we see, and there's a very interesting thing going on, if it's we who mold ourselves, and this is a big temptation right now, that there's a lot of ideology, I have to be my true self. And what we find is that as people try to shape themselves, they become disoriented. We see that those folks who are trying to make themselves who they are and be their authentic selves are experiencing much higher rates of psychological disorder and suicide, especially among the young and especially among boys. This is a very serious issue among young people, more, more prominently among uh, males uh, in their teens, the death rate has, uh, for high suicide has increased by 47% in the last few years. Because trying to mold ourselves does not seem to be making people happy. They don't know what they're supposed to be, and so they're shaping themselves. And quite frequently, while they may claim to be shaping themselves and finding their true self, very frequently, they are trying to please a few other people around them who may not necessarily have their best good in, in mind. That's the reality. I, you know, think of the people who are trying to encourage young people to so-called change their gender, which you cannot do. Uh, your DNA remains exactly double X or XY. No matter what changes you do, you are, that's what you were at the moment of conception. And oftentimes they're not telling people that their suicide rate goes to 42% of all who have those operations. They don't tell them that. They don't tell them that because the operations, their life expectancy is reduced to age 40. That's the average life expectancy. It's cut in half because the body's not made for that. So trying to reshape yourself doesn't make good sense. And what we need to understand that at the moment of death, whatever shape the clay is in, Again, throughout this life, we are like wet clay. At the moment of death, the clay is fired. And if you ever worked with clay vessels, once it's been fired, you can't reshape it. All you can do is file down some of the flanges that might be there, little fine points, rough, rough spots, things like that. That might fit our understanding of purgatory. There can be a purification, but there's no changing of that at all. And this moment of death that defines us for all the Trinity leads us to pay attention to people's last words. It's been one of my privileges as a priest, being with people as they are getting ready for death, when they have that privilege. Not everybody does. A lot of people are, are surprised by moments of death. 
They don't, we don't know when we're going to die unless you're on death row in prison. Then they tell you, and that's the punishment. But for the rest of us, we don't know. But for the ones who are ill and dying a little more slowly, they have a chance to prepare. And uh, uh, one example of the importance of last words at death would be St. Thomas More, who, as he was going up to be killed, he spoke to his executioner, who was going to cut off his head in just a few seconds afterwards, and said to him, pray for me as I will for thee, that we may merrily meet in heaven. What a line to give to the man. It shook the man, shook him more than it bothered St. Thomas. But he had faith, and that defined who he was. And he remained true to Christ and his words and to the church and the pope. And he could make that prayer. Just as that executioner and those around him remembered St. Thomas's final words, or the final words of people like Blessed Miguel Pro, Viva Cristo Rey, as he held out his arms with his rosary in his hand, he said, Long live Christ the King. That's his last words. Good one to meet our Lord with. Our Lord said last words, and they were remembered by his disciples because they understood to be defining words. And these are so important that in many Catholic churches around the world on Good Friday, we have what's known as the Tre Ore celebration between noon and 3 o'clock there'll be seven sermons on the seven last words of Christ. Archbishop Sheen used to preach that, I think at St. Agnes Church in New York City every year. And you can get a book that pulls those together. Wonderful, wonderful collection of his sermons on Christ's last words. And we want to take a look at these statements of Christ. So, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said in Matthew 27, verse 46. Also in Mark 15, verse 34, you see in both places. That, what is he doing? He is quoting verse 1 of Psalm 22. That's the opening line. Now remember, at this time, the time of Christ, the Psalms didn't have numbers. The numbers weren't put there until the 11th century AD by a Catholic monk in England. He put the chapters on the Bible, including the Psalms. So, you know, that, that came later. So he just, this, how they always quoted the Psalms, using the opening line as a way to say it, that's the one I'm citing. And we've already seen that this opening of Psalm 22 is extremely important because of all the Psalms, this one gives some of the most important references to events during Christ's death. For instance, in Psalm 22, uh, verses 16 to 18, we see the Roman soldiers are fulfilling actions described in that psalm. Not because they said, hey, you know, the Jewish people have this psalm. Let's make it happen here. They were pagans. They didn't know the book of Psalms. But we see, for instance, Psalm 22, verse 17. It says, I can count all my bones. The soldiers and Pilate who ordered them to scourge Jesus would have torn the flesh off of his body during the scourging so you could see bone. And then in Psalm 22, verse 16, they have pierced my hands and feet. Roman soldiers say, yeah, let's not time we can fulfill this psalm. No, they just nailed him because that's what they did. And they nailed his hands and feet to the cross. And then in Psalm 22, verse 18, 
They divide my garments among them, and for my raiment they cast lots. Do you think the Roman soldiers said, hey, that's another one, we can fulfill that too. Yeah. That's not what was on their mind. They just wanted his clothes because he had nothing else. And they wanted something besides their regular wages. So that's why they threw, threw lots, cast lots, uh, you know, throw the bones they would use as a type of dice. So this is something that our Lord is trying to use to show all the Jewish people that were there who did know Psalm 22. They would know that Psalm that he is fulfilling that, what they see around them, what they had been mocking him for, being on the cross and losing his clothes and all that. Now he is pointing out Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in this way, they can be reminded of the rest of the Psalm and how he is fulfilling the Old Testament. This isn't a curse. But then there's another element too. Psalm 22 verses 1 and 2 goes like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. This is extremely important because on one hand, the psalmist feels totally abandoned by God. And this isn't the only psalm where the psalmist feels abandonment. Psalm 88 is another one, and there are a few others as well. But at the same time that he feels abandoned, he really knows he isn't because he's speaking to God about the experience of abandonment. If he was totally abandoned, why would he call on God? But he knows God is there, but he still has this feeling of abandonment. And this is something that Christ makes his own as he's there suffering very painfully on the cross. This is a great agony that he is going through. And in one of the points going on here, he is uniting himself to everybody who feels abandoned by God. There are times when life is very, very difficult. There are awful things that happen in life. And people are tempted to feel abandoned. Why don't you care? Why don't you do something? And yet we can be with Christ because he chooses to be with us in those moments of abandonment. And that's what's key about this. And this is something <clears throat> in terms of the theme of this book, Wheat and Tares. All of those people, especially the young folks, who felt abandoned by God when they were being abused by Christ's priests, when they were being abused and afterwards, and they didn't know what to do and all that confusion, they can say this prayer and know that they're saying it with Christ, not despite him, but with him. But it also applies to the people who go through so many other kinds of horrible suffering. We have to remember that in the midst of suffering, we don't really improve our situation if you say, well, my suffering is worse than yours. I'm Jewish, and the Jewish people suffered more than these people. Or I'm from Biafra, and we suffered more. Or I'm from Ethiopia, or from Rwanda, and the other atrocities. We don't do well to try and trump my suffering over yours. That does us no good as human beings. Instead, we enter and cry loudly with Jesus on the cross together. Whether it's the suffering of those who were in the Holocaust, those who were in Biafra, or in Rwanda, or in the communist gulags, or Pol Pot's Cambodia, all of this horror that is wreaked upon us, we cry out with 
Christ and we meet him in that suffering. This is where we cry out with him, feeling abandoned, and yet we cry to God knowing that he's there. It may be the only honest way to pray through that kind of suffering, but it's something that we keep authentic in our relationship with God if we do that. Expressing confidence in God and yet telling him our experience. And in the midst of that suffering, we even praise God. This is something that we can also do if we pray this psalm. Now that sounds a little odd, but what I want to do is take a little break and we'll come back and talk about how in the midst of this suffering, we can also bring praise to God, not despite it, but because of the suffering. So stay with us and we'll discuss that just a little bit further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just want to remind you, Father Miguel Marie, MFBA, oh, Father Miguel here from the Frari, is planning to do a pilgrimage to the shrines of Italy and the Amalfi Coast on September 19th to October 1st, 2024. So if you want more information, just go to visitationpilgrimages.com or call 256-347-1475. All right, now we are going back to Psalm 22. Uh, as I mentioned, he, our Lord cites Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The introduction of the psalm, but it implies the whole psalm. And right after those verses of feeling abandonment, it's interesting how Psalm 22 then moves in verses 3 to 5 to praise of God where it says, again, then this is part of the confidence that is being expressed in the midst of feelings of abandonment. When it says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To thee they cried and were saved, and in thee they trusted and were not disappointed. This has an expression of confidence and praise because the Lord had helped Israel when they were suffering. And this is important for us to remember when we are going through great difficulties. Most, for most people, life is not one of unmitigated suffering. There are moments of joy as well for most people. And it's important to remember those times when we did find comfort with God, when we are sometimes tempted to feel so abandoned that we want to abandon God. To also remember, no, I'm going to praise you in the midst of my suffering. Not despite it, but I'm even going to praise you for it. I've mentioned a number of times over the years a wonderful little book by a Methodist minister named Merlin Carruthers. It's called Prison to Praise. And how he learned to praise God in all circumstances. That's what scripture says to do, to praise God in all circumstances. And here this psalm is part of that teaching in scripture, in the New Testament, it comes from the old, that you praise God even in the midst of difficulties and recognize that you are enthroned in the praises of Israel. If I want you to be the king of my heart and the king of my life and to form me, then I need to praise you now. 
while I'm going through suffering. And that's implied by our Lord citing that first verse of Psalm 22. And it's pretty much uh, an antidote. A lot of times, you know, I, I've, I think most of us have noticed that if you watch even television news, the quality of language spoken by people has declined. There's a, people are not as nice to each other and they use more bad language, men and women alike. And this is something that we see a lot of if you pay attention, more and more uh, words that my mother and the soap bar came together. <laughs> Uh, those words are now on the news as well, you know, and all over the place. And uh, these, these things were, uh, you know, not the way that we respond. But the antidote to using bad language, and certainly the antidote to uh, using God's name in vain, is to praise him for the problems. And that's one of the things going on. And... Then there's also another part of the psalm that I want us to consider, and that is in verses 6 through 8. In Psalm 22, verse 6, it begins, But I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Notice how we've mentioned over the last few months the number of times that the, the soldiers and the crowd mocked our Lord. That was also predicted in this psalm. So by quoting it, he's also putting in context the suffering that he had to endure through the mockery. And... You know, they're mocking him because he has faith. Because he committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Something that is repeated, by the way, in the Wisdom of Solomon, one of the books that many non-Catholic Bibles have taken out, but it was also a prediction of Christ's suffering. And just as this is here. And then there's still yet another aspect of this psalm that relates to Christ on the cross. In verses 9 to 10, Psalm 22, verses 9 to 10, where it says, Yet you are the one who took me from the womb. You did keep me safe upon my mother's breasts. Upon thee was I cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. I cannot help reading that verse without thinking of John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, where St. John himself standing at the cross said, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, he said, woman, behold your son. And then to the disciple, behold your mother. I can't help but think about her being there when this part of the Psalm 22 reminds the Lord that you took me from the womb and you know, from my mother's breast. And then you can also think about Luke chapter 2 verse 34 and 35, when Simeon is in the temple holding the baby Jesus at the presentation and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed that she is present and sharing in this because of the, you know, certainly it was predicted by Simeon when Christ was an infant at the presentation in the temple, but also this psalm gets us ready to understand 
the role of Mary at the cross. And then we can take a look at Psalm 22, verse 11, where then this, the psalmist, and this certainly applies to Jesus, says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Our Lord's disciples were not there. None of those who had, had healings were there. None of the folks that had eaten bread and fish were there. He, there's nobody to help him except God. And by praying this psalm, this is a, a very, very important part. So we see that even in the uh, depths of this pain in verses um, uh, 22, uh, beginning with verse 19 and following, it says, you know, to be not far off. O oh, you, my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, my afflicted soul from the horns of wild oxen. This is, you know, where he feels, you know, this pain that people are around him like animals. And that in this pain uh, and torment, all he's got is God. And this is an experience of people from all over the world that in the midst of terrible situations, you've, all you've got is our Lord. And then I would just mention that the, the psalm concludes with words of thanksgiving. Um, that in verses 22 to 26, he gives thanks to the Lord. Something that uh, it says, well, I'll just read it. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you sons of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you sons of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise and the great congregation, my vows I will pay before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. And may your hearts live forever. This section of the psalm especially evokes for me recollections of the Holy Eucharist. The Eucharist has its meaning in the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is the representation of Christ's death in an unbloody way. And we call it the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving, just as this part of the psalm says. So we need to pray that and enter our sufferings into the Mass, offer them up and join them with Christ in the Eucharist. And to do this to the ends of the earth, as a matter of fact, uh, verses 22 to 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn, the, turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship him, for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. We celebrate Holy Mass every day from one end of the earth to the other. There is barely a place, even at the international date line, there is a Catholic church right there. So that Mass, especially Midnight Mass, begins there on any of our feasts and throughout the whole world. We worship Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And this is something, as we pray the psalm with Jesus on the cross, we can help to see his suffering in light of that. We don't want to be like those people who say, oh, he's calling on Elijah. No, he's not. He's calling on the Lord God. No, we want to not just bring him some you know, vinegar or something, 
we have to understand that we also call on God when we're in the midst of our difficulties. And instead of being like the people who misheard him and then said, well, Elijah didn't show up, so I guess he is a failure. No. God is the one that's going to show up and will raise him from the dead. And we are with those who pray this psalm and recognize very much that we join with him at Mass, in our sufferings, in offering our sufferings, and in being united with him in praying that psalm in all the difficult situations of our lives too. This is what we seek when we listen to Christ's words on the cross. All right, we'll stop there. We'll continue on with Christ's words next week, which is Holy Week. Uh, but now I'd like to take uh, time to start looking at some of the questions we have. And we have a question here from our studio. It's a wonderful studio audience here. And man, where are you from? Bloomington, Indiana. I want to hold that closer to yourself there. Bloomington, so, Indiana. Good to have you here. Welcome Thank to you. the home of the University of Indiana, as I recall. Yes, I'm about five minutes from the university. There you go. So what's your question or comment? It's on uh, gay marriage. If we were all created by God and we're all sisters and brothers, uh, sisters and brothers cannot mate, so they're playing house. So how can they make uh, gay marriage legal if it's a fantasy world that they have invented themselves? Yeah, it, this is something that is done under the law. And if you remember, the reasoning to allow gay marriage was uh, for a lot of legal issues. For instance, um, you know, the, the rights of inheritance, you know, they, they, that was one of the things they were concerned with, and also rights of visitation. Um, you know, it, uh, th there certainly have been a number of uh, issues that have shown up um, with gay marriage, including a uh, large rate of divorce. Um, because those relationships uh, sometimes last you know, a number of years, but rarely do they last as uh, among the men in particular uh, as something that is uh, you know monogamous. You know that that's that's not very common. That usually breaks down in about two and a half years, and then uh, among. Uh, 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 gay women, that's different. Then They tend to be more faithful to each other uh, statistically, um, but they have other difficulties. Uh, I think, you know, uh, you know, this is what the law has, largely because it certainly keeps separated from law any considerations of the Ten Commandments. Remember, this the Supreme Court that legalized this. And uh, the, the same Supreme Court that had rejected uh, allowing the Ten Commandments to be in schools and other public places. So they, that's a way for them to say uh, that, you know, you can't use those principles. And you can't, uh, uh, of course, it was the same Supreme Court that in 1947 and 48 had also decreed a separation of church and state. You know, again, that's not in the Constitution. It, it's a Supreme Court decision uh, proposed by um, Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black, who was himself very committed to the, more committed to the Masonic Lodge than he was to Christianity, apparently. Um, so these, you know, the, the, the law is not based on Christian uh, considerations, and that's one of the things that we're dealing with a lot in our society. We have a question from Regina, who is in New York. Regina, what can we do for you? Hi, Father Mitch. Um, yes, does a priest have the right to record a confession or say that he is going to when you walk into a confessional? Also, does he have the right to accuse you of anything that certain individuals have accused you of, to single you out, to make you feel absolutely horrible, that the parishioners are doing this against me, and he goes along with this to hurt me? 
and yeah. puts it right up in the bulletin that, you know, about anger and stuff like this. And then I'm trying to defend myself. Okay. A couple things, Regina. First of all, if he is, or any priest, is recording confessions, you better report that to the bishop. Uh, there, there's, this is not uh, something that is permittable at all. It's something that you cannot, um, you, you just cannot do. You know, th this is a very serious offense if that's what's going on. You know, again, I'm not there, so I, I can't say one way or the other for sure. But you better find that out. And secondly, canon law also prohibits priests from preaching or putting in a bulletin or anything other way various points that are made in confession. So if I, if I happen to be there on a certain uh, Saturday hearing confessions and I hear just a whole line of people who are all committing adultery, I'm not allowed to say, and there's a lot of adultery going on in this parish and it's got to stop. You know, people, you can't do that. You, you know, you, uh, you can't even say that there's a lot going You just can't preach about adultery after you hear all that because people will think that you're on the edge or going over the edge of breaking the seal. So find out, um, uh, know what's going on. You may simply need to, you know, uh, again, make sure this is true. These are very serious accusations. You need, if so, you need to take them to your local bishop and get this reconciled uh, through him. He's the one who is in charge of it, not I. So get the facts very carefully, because they're serious, and go to the bishop to take care of that, because neither one of those is permitted. Okay? All right, we'll have to take another break. We'll be back in a couple minutes, so please stay with us. First of all, I want to invite you to join me this Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. I'll be sitting down with a good friend of mine and the former host of EWTN's The Journey Home, Marcus Grodi. He will be here to discuss a new collection of testimonies from converts and reverts who are talking about spiritual renewal, hope, and healing. So be wonderful to have him back here and talk about his new book and have you join us in the conversation. So please do. All right, we have another call. We have Judy in Iowa. Judy, what can we do for you? Well, good afternoon, Father Mitch. My question is, um, were the other criminals or criminals whipped and scourged and did they carry the cross or the tree like Jesus did? We all treated alike, or was Jesus singled out? No, uh, it, we don't see any mention of them being scourged. Now, they would have carried their own crosses, that's for certain. But their scourging was something that was, uh, Jesus was singled out. Pilate had Jesus scourged, and his hope was that that would make the crowd happy with his punishment and then have him uh, let him go. He didn't want to execute him. So he scourged him as a way to say, well, he's some sort of a troublemaker. I guess we'll just scourge him and then let him go. And that wasn't enough for the crowd, as we know from the gospel. They said, no, crucify him. 
So, but the others were not included in the scourging. Okay? Does that help? All right, I guess so. So we have a question here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Hammond, Louisiana. Hammond, Louisiana. I love that area. That's a good, good, good place. So what so, can we do for you? So my question is, you said that when we are experiencing pain and suffering, we are to praise the Lord, even mm -hmm. in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. You also said that we are to join our suffering with Christ, mm -hmm. specifically in the Mass, and offer it up as we're taught mm -hmm. as little children. Are we also supposed to then ask the Lord to relieve the suffering and take it away from us and heal us? Absolutely. And, you know, that, that there's, it's not that the suffering in itself is a good thing. You know, it's not that we say, oh, this is great. No, you get to, no, 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 no. We want suffering to be gone. But we can, so we can pray for it to be gone, but we can also pray you know, with thanksgiving that it's there, because quite frankly, in for a good many of us, a lot of people, uh, you know, become more wise in the midst of suffering. A lot of times you learn some lessons you probably wouldn't want to learn, but, you know, they're good lessons. But it doesn't mean that... Uh, except for some people who are called to a bit more of that. Otherwise, we don't, um, you know, seek the suffering for its own sake. Uh, we work through it and pray that it go away. We want to pray for the sick to be healed. You know, I'm doing that on a regular basis. Uh, all of us should. But we also can learn from the suffering and praise God in the midst of it. All right, we have another caller. Uh, I'd prefer to remain anonymous in Massachusetts. Um, what's your question? Oh, um, yes. I asked if... Oh. Yeah, go Is ahead. someone else talking? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I, was, I used to be a nurse. I'm a senior, and uh -huh. I signed up to sign my body to science at the Harvard Medical School, mm -hmm. and I was told that they cremate after... And then they have like a, a, it's for everybody where they bury the ashes yes. unless somebody claims them, which I probably wouldn't have. And so I, I, someone told me in the church that that was a sin and I just don't know. And then there's another separate yeah. issue, which has me concerned that it was on the news. I don't know if you saw it, but somebody, uh, they had a big ring going on in Harvard Medical where they were selling body parts. And basically people's body parts from their eyeballs to their toes are being made into pocketbooks and scary dolls and all kinds of things nationwide, you know, and I was like, oh, mm. geez. Well, now that's on the news, hopefully they correct that problem, but, um, you know, but, and that has me concerned, but I hate waste, and I figured, you know, if you're going to, you know, my body will help surgeons, you know, whatever, if there's the right. cancer that I used to have doesn't affect donations, they can use body parts. I know it sounds morbid, but I was a nurse, and it's a necessity. No, no, no. No, it, that, that's, this is an important issue. No, and thank you for the question, actually. Uh, no, it is permissible to donate your body to science. Uh, this is something that you give your permission, and uh, medical students use it to learn uh, how to deal with various illnesses and how to do surgery. This is uh, a very important thing, and it's, it's, the, the church recognizes that. We just ask that the um, remains are buried respectfully. They can be cremated and then buried, um, but, but not just tossed away or put in the garbage or something. That would be wrong, or it would be very wrong to be selling the body parts. You're right. You know, that, that's, that's not what you sign up for. It's just for science, not for fashion. And that's something very disrespectful. But, you know, we saw the same thing going on with the selling of body parts from fetuses that were aborted. They were using the, that as well. And, you know, as the one lady said very famously, not knowing she was being filmed, well, yeah, I'm going to sell these body parts. I want to get a Lambertini. I don't think that's going to go over. Uh, bad enough that you're doing the abortion than to sell the body parts. You know, see how that goes over in the day of when your clay is baked. 
Let's get another question. Ma'am, where are you from? Uh, North Vernon, Indiana. And good to have you here. Welcome. And Thank what's you. your question? My question is, when you have a person that you know is terminally ill mm -hmm. and throughout their illness, you, you know, they have been anointed, mm -hmm. but they suddenly, unexpectedly slip into the dying process. Yes. Is it too late to call a priest? No, no. And, you know, uh, I've, I've been at the bedside of a number of people who have slipped into coma. And I'll give them the final commendation. Obviously, I can't hear their confession. They can't speak anymore at that state. But I can give them the final commendation and the apostolic blessing. With the, uh, and especially if they've been to confession and have been anointed, um, then they get the plenary indulgence. Okay? So, no, no, that's a good thing. That, you know, but try not to wait until then. They'll call the, you know, like you said, you, you, they went ahead of time, but call them otherwise. We have another email here I want to get to. Father Paco, for more than 40 years, I didn't confess and I didn't go to church, although I have always been trusting in God. For the past eight years, I've been going to church two to three times a week. I take communion regularly, but without confession. I pray to God, regret and sincerely ask forgiveness for my sins. I cry bitterly while doing it. Can I continue to do this without committing a sin? Pierre. Pierre, I would go to confession. You are obviously repentant of your sins. And, you know, uh, you know I can't imagine a, a priest not, you know, being very uh, willing and happy to hear your confession. Um, don't be embarrassed. Uh, as I oftentimes say, I started hearing confessions on Skid Row in Chicago. It's been uphill since. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it doesn't, we're, we're accustomed to the sinners because they're pretty much the same. You know, the saints are really creative. The sinners do pretty much the same stuff. So, you know, th there's no more surprises. And uh, it's um, something that won't bother the priest, to, won't embarrass you. That's not our point. But go to confession and, and get that right before uh, this Palm Sunday, for instance. Uh, try to avoid the Holy Week rush and get to confession now. And God bless you, Pierre. Welcome. To, good to have you back, yeah, you know, coming to Jesus. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank all these folks who, uh, I guess it's a bike club, right? Yeah, good to have you here. Good to have you. It's a Catholic one, though. They're, not, they're, they're with the angels, not, <laughs> not our angels, not the other guys. So good to have you all here. And may the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May our Lord lead you and guide you safely in all of your ways by his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And this program and all of our programs are brought to you by you. That was how our Lord Jesus inspired Mother Angelica to have this network here. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we'll pay all of our bills, especially those coming up with Holy Week as we bring you all kinds of specials. God bless you all and thank you.